A physical button, no matter how well engineered, is going to be subject to the laws of physics. When you press it, it's going to wiggle a bit and not provide an absolute perfect mathematical contact. It's going to bounce going down, bounce going up, and possibly, if you're holding it down, your finger can wiggle, it might bounce there a little bit too. Here's a button. I've just got it hooked up with a pull-up resistor. Press the button, it goes low, let it go, it goes high. Nice and easy, simple button. But, let's observe the transition. And you can see it's not perfect. It's not really that bad, but it's not perfect. It does wiggle. This is a really well-engineered button that doesn't bounce that much. How about two alligator clips? That's a switch, too. How bad is just simply touching these together? Not too bad that time. Ooh, that's getting a little worse. You see it? Here's the whole waveform. Let's go ahead and zoom a bit so we can see the press and release. Bam. Not too bad. Bam. Getting worse. Bam. Ah, pretty good. Bam. Oh, boy. Switch bouncing. Now, you may say this is a stupid example, but I think it's still valid because you can have crazy mechanical switches. It can just be a piece of metal that's bent up and you push down. That's a simple switch, especially in an industrial context. What more reliable switch than just a big hunk of metal you press down? Seems reasonable to me. So my method will handle this just fine. If it handles the worst case, it'll certainly handle the best. That's the principle. But what is my method? So let's say here's your button. And what you'd usually do is hook up your pull-up resistor, just like so. When you press the button, it reads low. When you release the button, it reads high. But the waveform bounces, and you get spurious activation, so you have to debounce. So you turn this into an RC network. The simplest and most popular way to do this, whenever you Google switch debounce, you'll just see this. So what happens here is when the button is not pressed, the capacitor charges up and cuts off current so that the top of the capacitor is up at the supply and it's still a pull-up resistor. When you press the button, it discharges the capacitor through itself, basically, because the capacitor's got plus here and minus here. So it discharges through the button, through ground, back into the capacitor. The voltage drop on the capacitor goes to zero, and then this reads low, but then the charging is much slower because the charging goes to this resistor. So you get a curve like this where it goes bam and it tries to rise and bounce but it's not able to rise very much. The bouncing keeps draining it fast but charging slowly and then it's stable and then it bounces and keeps discharging and when it's done bouncing it charges all the way up and here's this curve. So this works fine. This works fine almost all the time but if you watched my video about microcontroller sampling rate, you could have it sample multiple times in this region and still get a spurious rating if this charging curve is slow enough. If you can make the charging curve fast enough, then it'll be it'll charge between samples and you'll be fine. But if you make the charging time faster, then these get taller. It's possible that that gets into the intermediate range too. So like I said, to be clear, I'm not trying to contradict existing knowledge. This is usually fine, but I don't like it. I want something better. And there's also one other thing. A lot of the time, this is actually going to be fine, but if you plug this into certain devices, it can actually surge the, the rapid discharge, because it's, it's fine for the capacitor, it's fine for the switch, because very little energy is actually going. It's a short circuit, so it's got milliohms of resistance or less. So there's a ton of power dissipation, but it's very quick. So this is not harmful at all. This is perfectly safe. But I have discovered that it can actually surge and mess up. It'll, it'll induct or something. I don't know what it is. But it messed up my chip and it actually bounced the output. It made the output of a flip-flop bounce like an RF wave. So you want to have a resistor here. It'll be small. You know, maybe even 10 ohms. I was using 27 ohms just because I had it in my box. But something very, very small to just control it a little bit. So that the the bouncing, it'll charge up a little bit, but it should still be fine. So you want a little resistor there. But this can be made still better. Because even perfectly, you're going to get this charging curve. So you sharpen the charging curve. The first thing you think is add a transistor. And the transistor is going to amplify the base current. And it's going to saturate very quickly. And what you'll get is basically just the same thing, but sharper. So it's like you accelerate the charging, but you're not actually accelerating the charging. So this still is going to discharge as fast and charge as slowly, but you know, by here it's going to saturate and it's just going to go high. But I don't think that's sharp enough. I would like something even better. So how about a comparator? What if you pick a voltage? You have your signal in, you have some reference, and here's the out, and 
the gain, it's like a super transistor. The gain here is so crazy that it's going to do the same thing the transistor did, but even sharper. I 100% guarantee that this is going to be fast enough, but the problem is it can wiggle. This comparator is not 100% stable at the transition, so when your input is about at whatever reference voltage, when it's just about to switch, whatever reference voltage you pick, like two-thirds supply or whatever, it's not stable, and you could get multiple activations when it's right there, especially if there's noise on the line. You know, 10 millivolts noise is not going to matter, generally, unless it's flip-flopping your comparator. But then, speaking of flip-flops, or rather latches, we have the beauty of a 555 timer, which I have discussed in the video about microcontroller sampling rate, but basically we just sharpen the signal. It's the same signal, we just have this right here. We're not doing anything different, but we have a timer, we have threshold, and we have trigger, which are shorted together to the input signal, and then the output of that is our output. The 555 timer has a voltage range. If you go up above on the threshold, or you go down below on the trigger, it flips the output. There's a, there's a latch in there, and it flips it on or off. It flips it on when trigger goes below. It flips it off when threshold goes above. So this switch is active low, this button is active low, and then the output becomes active high, so it inverts it, but you're just reading it, you can read it opposite, it doesn't matter. But the point is, there's no wiggling in here. This is no longer an indeterminate wiggle range, it is an inactive range. Nothing will happen here, and nothing will happen if it wiggles at these lines either, because it's, it's almost like it's clocked on the rising and falling edge. It's not a clock, but for this entire range here, the only thing that can happen is trigger is triggered. Once trigger is triggered, nothing will happen in this range. And then you have to go up here, and then threshold can threshold once. And then if it wiggles, nothing's going to happen. So the comparators and the flip-flop, or the latch rather, inside the timer, I should say out, inside the timer, make it so that wiggling doesn't matter, bouncing doesn't matter, because you've got that whole safety range, and the latch is going to switch rapidly, just bam. So you're going to have your sharp signal down, your sharp signal up, and what I do is I size the capacitor as small as possible and the resistor as large as possible. And the reason for that is to emphasize the discharging. So I had, you know, 27 ohms here with a 1.5 microfarad capacitor and a 500,000 ohm resistor, and I got about like two-thirds of a second. Because for demonstration, obviously, you wouldn't have it that big for a real button, but the idea is that the charging is immensely slow, the capacitor discharging is immensely fast relative to each other. So it's going to discharge on the first bounce, and then bounce, 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 and it can never get anywhere. And even if it bounces during, it's going to go like that. And then when you let it go, it'll charge. Oh, it bounced. And it'll just keep going, but finally it'll charge and come up. And then the output is going to be a hard square wave, like so, all the way up to, you know, about two-thirds supply-ish, and back down. And the output is going to be a nice square wave. And the key is it's going to encapsulate all the bounces. The bouncing here and the bouncing there when you press and release. And it'll work for something like an SPDT switch too, because you flip it to high, you flip it to low, and in between it's going to be stable. And how do you size it? Well, two thirds is about 0.67. And R times C, your RC time constant, is around 0.63, I think. It's roughly two-thirds. It's like one over E or something, but whatever it is, it ends up being kind of in the neighborhood of two-thirds. So just do R times C, and that's basically going to be how long it's going to take to charge from the last bounce to turning on again. So that's how you can determine your latency. From, from the time that the switch has finished bouncing and it's completely let go to the time it triggers, that's about your RC. So you decide on that time, and then you pick a small capacitor, a large resistor, and then this resistor should be as small as possible. If you can get away with not having this resistor, feel free. But when I did not have the resistor, my output 
was garbled. Every time that it discharged, the output, it, it surged through the chip somehow. It didn't hurt the chip, but it ruined the output. But with a 27 ohm resistor here, it was flawless. And the discharge time ended up being in the microseconds, so that was great. So that's the trick. You use the standard debounce that you'll see everywhere on the internet. This is the same one you'll always see, except you plug it into a 555 timer and you emphasize small capacitor, large resistor. That's all it is. You just sharpen the signal. You may not need to do this. If you don't need to do this, save yourself the chip, fine. But in my opinion, I like it to be nice. And for a single extra chip that's gonna cost me three cents, it's pretty nice. So let me show you on the oscilloscope. So here's my switch again. And like I said, if it can handle this, it can handle anything, because that is just plain gross. So now I have it hooked up through the timer. The yellow line is the output. The green line is the voltage going into the threshold and trigger pin. If I touch the contact, it turns this LED on and then turns it off. So you can see about the time I've got it configured to discharge, or rather charge. So now if you'll watch the lines, if I tap it and then tap again, and I keep tapping, every time I tap, it discharges, and it discharges really fast. And if I let it go up, then it switches, and then I can just keep tapping again as much as I want, and every time, so you imagine I press the button and it bounces, and then it stops bouncing. Maybe as I'm pressing it, it bounces a little bit. Then I let it go, it bounces, and then it charges back up. That's the principle. So all of the bouncing from start to end is encapsulated within the output signal. But how does it look? It looks like this. Let me shrink it a little bit and do it again. So right here, the green, let's uh, make this a little more visible. The green is the threshold and trigger voltage. This is discharging through the 27 ohm resistor. So if we zoom in on the time a little bit, we can see one of these divisions, if I shrink it that far, this division is only about 50 microseconds. So if you shrink that resistor, it'll still work just fine. But if we zoom in, you can see the output is nice and stable. It surged a little too high, but that can probably be rectified with capacitors. The point is it didn't surge too low, it didn't bounce. It's the stable region or just higher, which means the pin is guaranteed to read correctly. So if you look here, you can kind of see it in action. If I press and release, you can zoom in a little bit more. But as this oscilloscope very slowly draws when I've zoomed this far out, if I press it and I keep pressing it, you can see that it keeps trying to charge, but not actually charging. I'm not letting it. And then, and let's, let's push this left a little bit. When I do let it charge, there it goes. So from press to release, you can see here, the nice square wave output, very, very sharp, immensely sharp, where we discharge and then the sharp upturn. And then on the other end, the capacitor is charging back up, and when it reaches that threshold voltage, the timer turns back off. It's really that simple. Is it overkill? Yeah. Do you really need to do this? Probably not. But if you do want to, there you go. Most importantly, it makes me happy, and I like being happy, especially in these times we find ourselves in. As I discussed in the previous video about microcontroller pin sample rate, you can simply plug any digital signal into this 555 timer in this way, and it'll sharpen up nice and pretty. Even if it's not a debounce signal, you can sharpen any signal. It also adds noise immunity. If you have a signal that wiggles because of noise, putting it in the timer this way gives you that nice, safe, one way, you know, trigger only down, threshold only up, and the disabled range in the middle. So you get noise immunity. So you could do that too. So I hope you found this enlightening. And I will also be seeing you.